it gives me great pleasure to introduce a panel to talk about trends in corporate travel. We begin with Arlene Coyle, Senior Vice President, Corporate Sales, Amadeus IT. Next is Ronnie Gurian, GM, Global Head of Uber for Business. Next is David Holyoke, Global Head of Airbnb for Work. And last but not least, it gives me pleasure to introduce truly an icon of the industry, Jeff Katz, the founding chairman and CEO of Orbitz and CEO of Juranea, also former CEO of Swiss Air, also former CEO of Orbitz. I had to add that, right? So, okay. So, we're going to talk about corporate travel, but we had some news today, obviously, that uh, was, I think, surprising to some. And I just wanted to ask the panel if you have any comments on the acquisition of Fair Logics by Sabre. What do you think that's going to do to the market? What's your initial reaction? If you can comment on that. And specifically, do you think it has any bearing on corporate travel? Anyone? No one wants to say anything. <laughs> You don't have to comment if you don't want to, no? No reactions. I mean, I guess I have to comment, don't I, from uh, Amadeus. But uh, what I would say is I, I honestly don't know how I feel. So tomorrow, Jim's on stage. Um, ask me again after Jim presents what it is he wants to do. <laughs> OK, fair enough. Do you have any comments? Well, you know, I, you know, Steve Hafner and I used to work for me, and he, he learned a lot of his best shtick from me. <laughs> um, no, look, I. I I get it. Um, I get why a, a company like Sabre would do it. I, I don't think it'll work. Uh, I think it creates an interesting opportunity for a bunch of new entities to go out and essentially rebuild what, what is a fancified API to, to American Sabre partition. But that's my point of view. I don't think it'll amount to much. Well, unusual. So let, let's get to the topic at hand. So, uh, there has always been this mixed bag with corporate travel of managing travel, managing compliance, getting preferred deals in place, and then the comfort of the traveler and the traveler having convenience. It certainly appears that since we have certainly maybe the mobile device being the, the catalyst for this, a uh, great more attention to com the comfort of the traveler which is challenging as we all travel. We know what it's like to travel, and if you travel for business. So I was wondering if you could talk about what needs to change in kind of the backbone of the industry in order to improve the service level to the customer and reduce friction within the process. This one you guys knew already, so you should have an answer. Who wants to start? I'll give it a go. Okay, why don't you start, Arlene? Yeah. Um, I think that when you look at the, the travel industry as a whole, and particularly the managed travel space, it really is a, an industry that's been dominated by the corporation. So the tech stack itself is something that you love, you know, more or less of. I don't know anyone who loves their expense management platform, you know, whether you're a traveler, whether you're an accountant, or whether you're a, a travel manager. But the issue for me really is, is not so much the tech stack itself, is that it's an industry that's been built with the corporation in mind and not the corporate traveler in mind. And when you think about the spend that happens outside of that managed process, it's pretty phenomenal that there's something, there's something wrong. So there's plenty of opportunity for all of the players in the industry today to rethink a little bit about you know, what, what it is the traveler wants versus what it is the CFO wants or the CIO needs. So for me, there needs to be more interaction with the CHROs in an organization to work around the traveler themselves, as opposed to the technology or as opposed to the, you know, the, the, the travel process. True. So in your case, I have to, I have to tell you this with personal experience. I used to always rent a car when I was in Dallas. My, my, uh, my brother and my nephew lived there. And I went there, they were out of town, so I just called a ride share. It was so much easier <laughs> than going to the car rental and going through that. So I'm sure you've had a, a, mend a tremendous impact uh, helping that reduce that friction. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think what we see is, uh, depending on where you are in the spectrum of corporate travel, uh, there's an increasing push for 
kind of the consumerization of corporate travel. So like Uber, uh, Airbnb, what you're seeing is they provide such utility in a, in a really easy way that mimics like what people get on the consumer side. They're able to use that really seamlessly um, in their business travel. And that's creating this push then for the more managed uh, aspect of corporate travel. And so I think that trend is going to continue. I think more small, medium businesses are more at the forefront of looking at travel from a customer perspective, a uh, traveler perspective and being more innovative. But the bigger the company gets, the more the, the trends that Arlene mentioned start to dominate. And I think that's the, the tension and the, the dichotomy that you see in corporate travel. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I, I struggle with, I mean, I came from the managed travel world, right? I, I was owned and was a president of a travel management company. And then obviously now I've been on, on this side with, uh, with Airbnb, uh, kind of on the forefront of kind of this consumerization drive uh, going forward. I don't know why there has to be tension between uh, you know, what employees want and obviously what's good for the business. I think, um, I think generally cultures, companies, uh, compliance naturally comes with creating a program that's aligned with the business and the employees' needs. And I think consumerization is a good thing in that regard. Now, as, an, as, as a partner to the industry, we all have a responsibility to ensure that it has the right visibility and the right uh, flow of data and, and other things to help people have the visibility and maybe some of the things around duty of care and other protections that, that need to happen. But I don't know why there has to be this, what's good, you know, is it this side or that side? It can be both. It's just uh, having, that, having that level of responsibility and coming at it the right way. And Jeff, uh, the, sh the sharing of data is kind of the core of Jernia, right? So you're yeah, Jernia is, uh, Jernia Jernia is about data, really collaboration and sort of this real-time um, endeavor to let travel brands collaborate sort of dynamically with a lot of sort of flexibility. But, you know, to get at the point you raised about what might happen, it, it, you know, I, I think we would all agree that travel, it'd be great if travel were better, easier, et cetera. The TMC world, that's not what they do, they, you know, so, and at scale, there's not a clear replacement for them. So when, if you're at a big company and you're responsible for a few things related to corporate travel, you have to, you're inclined to do a deal with a company who can support you know, your, your corporate mission and those companies that can really serve that, they don't, they don't come with customer care, they don't come with customer ease, at least not yet. And, and honestly, I don't think that's gonna happen, which is why companies perhaps like Trip Actions have such interesting valuations. May or may not be worth the sort of the levels they're at, but they come at this with sort of the promise of something that can scale and serve a broad range of interests from integration with, with expense reporting to perhaps better usability, perhaps. Well, it's, it's actually pretty dramatic as far as the investment we've seen recently with Trip Actions and Uptake and TripSense and, and Lola and Travel Port Perk and Freebird. There was a point where it seemed like there was no innovation happening at all in the corporate travel space other than perhaps innovation from, from Uber and from Airbnb, but nothing really going into startups. Why is the TMC business so hot now? Why, why, why would you invest in a TMC at this level? And I've seen Trip Action. It's, it's very slick. It has some nice features. But it's not revolutionary. It's not that different. It's just a few less clicks, nicer screens. What, what's driving this? What do you think? Why, why, why do we have all this investment coming into corporate travel suddenly? I think, I mean, corporate travel is an area that is, um, there's, there's a certain perception that there's not been a lot of innovation in corporate travel, and, and it's probably because of the rules that govern the game. So when you look at corporate travel, there's obviously the corporation pays the bill, the traveler's not free to do what they want. So, and, and that dichotomy that exists between what a corporation wants versus what a traveler wants is what these guys like uh, TripAction or, or Lola are responding to. But it's quite interesting when you see the evolution already of Lola in a very short period in time and that coming together with Amex GBT. And I think that's a real indication of, of the ability of, of these smaller organizations to scale and to respond to the needs of global customers. You know, if you look at the, the TMC or the, the digital TMC by excellence was Egencia. And the Agencia model was exactly that, mapping the OBT together with the, the service and a single offer for corporations. 
But as SMEs scale, as content becomes much more fragmented, as the industry becomes more complex, I mean, that requires a huge amount of investment. And if I look at you know, Amadeus, the biggest aggregator of travel content worldwide, we invest 18.6% of our revenues in, in R&D. And we do that because it requires scale, it requires growth, it requires market presence. So what I like about these, um, these new entrants, the, the Lolas of the world and the trip actions, is that they really keep us on our toes about the UI, UX. But we're back to the first question, is that you know, there's so much more to business travel and a slick interface than a sexy connection you know, to some kind of a platform. It's, it's what's it behind it is what makes the difference. And that really is where it'll be interesting to see this time next year where trip actions sit. Yeah, I mean, any, any, any time you have a huge market that has been concentrated and I think is not serving the needs of, of uh, the whole community, not just, uh, not just the, the travel managers, but, but as robustly the, the, the traveler as well, then there's going to be money going in to try to capture that and eventually someone's going to crack it. And uh, it's going to be hard because the established players have such, such entrenched uh, positions and tremendous amount of complexity, but I think people will continue to fund uh, into that until somebody eventually comes up with the right level of innovation. I don't think people will stop doing that, given the, the size of the pie. Yeah, I mean, I mean you think about the, 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 the booking tool, right? It, it hasn't changed a lot since it came on the scenes in the mid to late 90s. Um, so you are seeing a lot of focus and innovation there. Um, and that's great, but I think it's a trend. But I'd like to see more focus on the actual trip experience, the journey, right, uh, versus the ease of booking. Uh, I mean, at some point, how quickly can you get it down? Uh, where, especially also, when you also think about where where mobile is going, um, and, the, and, and you know, especially in the lodging space, we see 66 percent. Uh, of, of our travelers obviously booking uh, their accommodations for business travel through mobile. That close, to that close to that departure time, I think it becomes even less and less with attachment rates about that full kind of experience versus more about when, what you need when you need it. Um, and then that allows us to start innovating a little bit more on the experience side of things. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Because if you look at the, the process itself and, and the, the actual spend that comes through that end to end, what we call the end to end process, the booking through to the expense management, it's only only about 50% of what actually goes into the trip itself. So the 50% that's been spent in destination has not been captured. Yeah. And that's the part where the industry still needs to work a little bit better together to, to really provide that service to the traveler. And you've, you've touched upon a point which is like fundamental, is what are we doing about mobile? Right. You know, we've got a bigger role to play in mobile and keeping that traveler engaged. And then you go back into the whole cycle of duty of care, expense management, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot to be done still. But um, you know, I would, I would argue that there's a lot to be done, but there, there's already a lot out there. You just need to bring it together. That's a great compliance area right there. We've put all this focus on air, lodging, and transportation, but think about all that does outside of that that doesn't usually get the same, mm. same level of, it, of focus and lots of opportunities for innovation there. So. Any, any other comments, Jeff? Um, um, you know, there's a lot of money chasing this. It's an old, old problem. And... Um, <laughs> I haven't seen a lot. I mean, I'm invested in a very small business travel application myself. I think it's a great, fascinating area. But I haven't seen a lot that's going to change the world of the corporate traveler. And um, I do think it's a big opportunity. Uh, um, it, when I go around and talk to corporate travel managers and we do our pitch, the thing that does excite them the most, which gets at your original question, is what can I do as a travel manager, or what can we do as a company to uh, improve our traveler's experience? And I don't think any of that thing, any of that has to do with the corporate travel manager, the travel management company, or for that matter, the ho most of the host systems that are underlying this process can either be used as they are, or you, know, you can address changing a little bit of this and that, but the, if you really want to make this change, you have to design from the traveler experience, and you don't end up saying, and I need to replace Amadeus to do that, and I've got to replace SAP Financials to do that. That isn't where the puzzle gets fixed. Now, there may be lots of other exciting things you can do in those arenas, but that's not how you improve the traveler experience. Well, you know, it's interesting. I have been talking to the corporate travel, the managed travel area about mobile since I started researching it, which was early 2000s, and certainly since 2008. And I have found them to be 
laggards in understanding the impact of mobile. It is really amazing. And I often would ask, I've done a lot of travel manager interviews, and I said, well, what's, what's your adoption? And they said, oh, 85, 90% adoption. How much mobile leakage do you have? Silence. They don't know. Some of them do, but most of them don't. So given that mobile has created a direct channel between a supplier and a customer, or intermediary and a customer, how do you think that's going to further evolve while the rest of that travel management crew, as you were saying, the corporate travel manager or the TMC kind of sits there trying to catch up? I, I mean, just to add one more item here, I was interviewed by one of the press organizations to get my reaction to the fact that certain TMC uh, mobile applications suddenly now have a booking capability for air. I said, this is news? that you have, you can book something on your app. Meanwhile, I think the traveler has left, the train has left the station, the traveler's there. So given that perception that there's less and less control, managed control, because there's a lot of control and power in the hands of the traveler, where do you think that, that's going? What's the next? Do you think we'll have offers delivered to travelers in managed programs directly? How is that going to evolve, your opinion? I think that's, our, I mean, in the case of Airbnb, that's already happening, right? So, I mean, booking is a given. I mean, booking is here on mobile. If anyone's debating that, that's, we're probably, they've got the wrong people in the room and, you know, we've probably got challenges as, as we go ahead. But, I mean, now it's more about assuming the booking is going to get done and how you deliver a great uh, platform experience th through that. Ultimately, how do you start to give more visibility. So we're starting to bring more insights into the neighborhood, the content, um, you know, helping with di facilitating dining, adding experience, and other things to complement that trip. Uh, those are things that are just a natural progression and will only accelerate uh, in the years ahead. So. Yeah, I think Uber's a little bit similar. So, right, we started as a direct-to-consumer app, obviously have a ton of adoption around the world, and people started using it for business purposes. And then Uber for Business is about how do you kind of bring it more into the fold uh, through duty of care, through providing policy. We have in partnerships with uh, a lot of the expense management companies around the world. And mobile actually takes it to the next level. So while I agree with you that you know, a lot of the ground, uh, a lot of the T&E spend is, is in destination and not captured. With, with Uber, we actually take this, you know, taxi, offline, on track spend and allow companies to have great visibility. And with mobile, actually have GPS tracking as well so they can see you know, exactly where the trips are taken. And so mobile actually is an enhancer to kind of closing some of those gaps, uh, depending on how you're approaching it. Norm, we have a question from the audience. Mm. Hi. Seema Modi with CNBC. My question is for Ronnie from Uber. If you want to become a market leader in corporate travel, why not just buy a big hotel operator or uh, a big airline? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, buy, a, buy an airline, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I think what Uber's mission is is really to be a platform for transportation broadly. So uh, think of uh, obviously rides, think of you know, bikes and scooters and uh, taking it to the next level. Our, our CEO has been on, on record kind of saying we have about 100 million riders today in any month. We're trying to get to a billion riders uh, in due course and that will require us to look at a much broader cross-section of transportation. So that's really our main focus. I don't know that we are as focused on getting into some of the verticals that you described. So I, I certainly think we'll expand the offering of Uber to be a broader transportation platform and that'll probably be our focus. So uh, actually, that's a great example uh, of uh, how, or you, you both are a great example of how the traveler drives the policy. So we did a survey of business travelers uh, near the end of 2016, and we asked about ride sharing, and we asked about home sharing. Both felt their company should have a policy about it. There was more resistance, as I'm sure you're aware, David, on home sharing. But it was not that long ago, 2014, that there was tremendous upheaval at GBTA over Uber. And now everyone seems to have incorporated Uber or one of the competitors into their program. How long is it going to take for Airbnb, David? I, I think we're here already. I mean, we're adding thousands of companies every week. Uh, uh, Airbnb for Work is uh, a business that's been growing at a 3x uh, standpoint the last couple of years. We've got 700,000 companies working with us. 
pretty much engaged with everyone on the BTN 100. Um, and a lot of that started with just employees within companies were naturally using the product for in their everyday consumer life, started to bring it in their business. We started to be able to, uh, to identify that, collect that information, and really start to have engaged conversations with companies. And it gets us to a point where, again, there's a comfort level. There is certainly uh, helping people understand um, that we have a, respon a joint responsibility, right? This isn't about just like put it out there and, and not help them obviously have that visibility and put some of the parameters and maybe some, some of the controls that they want in place uh, and help bridge that gap between their ecosystem and, and our world. Um, and so when you think about two years ago uh, when I started, you know, our average length of stay was about six and a half nights, right? It was a little bit of a longer stay. Um, today that's fallen just below five and our fastest growing segment is under three nights. Uh, that's the classic business travel use case right there. Um, I, I believe we're, we're becoming mainstream even though I don't like to use that word, so, yeah. That's great. So, uh, Jeff, you have been talking about uh, the control of the, of the customer that the big tech giants have, that Google, Facebook, Apple, and so forth. And that was kind of one of your motivations to, to get going with uh, Genera. 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 Very good. Uh, I'll get it. Thank you, Norm. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to get it right. Um, what, do you, what do you think about the state of things now? I mean, you were talking about this two or three years ago. It seems like it's gotten even more of a right. customer ownership issue. Well, look, I think Several years ago, I started having these conversations with leaders of big brands, and my terminology at the time was, you've got to be concerned about the rise of the gatekeepers. And I had this chart that in my day when I was at Sabre, you know, we were certainly viewed as a bad guy, and, and there was a certain level of you know, onerousness or gatekeeperitis that Sabre had, and then, then came along OTAs, and that was even bigger and better. But, but if you scale up on a logarithmic scale and you look at Amazon and you look at Google and you look at names we probably can't even name today, it, it's pretty frightening in a sense. So, and I, and there's, there's no way a company like Google or Amazon, to Steve, Steve made this point earlier, tra travel globally is something like a $3 trillion industry. They can't ignore verticals of that size. They're in it today. They're going to be in it tomorrow. They're going to create great experiences, and they will weave their way into the fabric of our lives. We won't even know it's happening. And, and they're on their way today, and as Steve said, you, it's hard to find that travel business plan at Google. Uh, there may not even be one, but the vision and the opportunity is grand. So I think you've got to get ready for it, not that they're going to be alone. And, um, and, and it's happening, and every day it's a little more clear depending on where you look, and there's players who aren't stepping into it very strongly yet, but they will, they can't not do it. Um, and so I think the thing to do is get ready for it. Genera came from a sort of a simple idea that said if you want to work with entities like that, the first thing you got to do is re-architect your business around being able to manage your data at a granular level. So if you're an airline, that means flight number. Who gets flight number? At what price? And who doesn't get flight number at what price? And once you begin to sort of organize your business around that in that way, then you can both interact capably with the gatekeepers and the non-gatekeepers. And uh, you realize that data is not just a way to facilitate better travel, it's a currency. And, and a Flight 49 being late has one value. Flight 49 with Jeff Katz on it has a different value. Flight 49 with Jeff Katz, 1K member, has a completely different value. And if you're not able to manage that and utilize that in the way you interact with all these companies, you're missing the boat of the future. And the benefit of focusing on that has been, at least in my estimation, that companies are more and more also able to say, hey, the benefit if I move in this direction is I can take care of travelers better. But also, I think we're all getting ready for a world where these big companies have a lot of influence in our travel lives, not just our search lives or our whatever lives. And, and, and you, you see you know, the possibilities even when you, when you see the way Uber works and how all of a sudden it's really easy to use Orbitz. I'm sorry, Uber. Sorry, Ronnie. Ronnie worked at Orbitz, just to be clear. Um, it's really easy to use Uber. For business, and life is painless, my expense 
is automatically gone. I don't even think about it anymore. Yeah. And so it is, the only thing that's not happening is duty of care, and that can be fixed in a heartbeat as well. So anyway, I think this data as currency is, has got to be dealt with uh, because the, the world where Google is a giant, more giant in travel and others are more giant in travel is coming, and, and brands have to get ready to deal with it. So one innovative company, actually, that won the first uh, BTN, which is a sister company of Focusrite, uh, Innovate contest a few years ago, it's a company out of Amsterdam called Roadmap. You're probably familiar with them. And most kind of look at that as what they do today, which is a digital itinerary. But the vision that, because I've spoken to the management there, and the, the vision is a little different. The vision is to have a kind of parent app that then, which is branded with the company, and they're working with companies like Microsoft to do this. So it would be a Microsoft app, then below it would be other apps that you would use. So rather than making the app into the booking engine, the umbrella app directs people directly to Uber, directly to Airbnb, directly to Marriott. Um, I'm wondering what you think of that idea. Do you, you think that, that that type of future where there is multi-distribution through different apps under an umbrella would, would work in a managed travel area? Mm, personally speaking, I'm not convinced. I don't think that that's the, the direction that the managed travel environment will go. I think it's more about bringing the, the solution to an environment that the traveler is familiar with in their corporate enterprise. So I think it's going to probably work more through, let's say, a messaging platform is that the entry point is nev not necessarily going to be an SBT, it may not be an expense platform, and, and even less a mobile app. It potentially could be through a messaging platform such as Slack, such as Outlook, or, or potentially through a Salesforce application. So we need to keep the, in order to really assure the adoption and facilitation of, of business travel from a, a, a traveler perspective, is that it needs to be where the traveler enterprise application sits. So I wouldn't be looking at mobile apps with going into new apps and into other apps, I would bring it to where the business traveler actually sits and then put the flow down from there. So it's a bit of a different um, angle to it. So by the way, the, the reason for that strategy is to capture out of channel as well. So that you know, if you can book on Marriott directly through the master app that has the name of the company on it, so it's a branded name, it's the Microsoft app, then you're, you're actually feeling like you're compliant because you're being told you can do that, and it keeps you in the ecosystem. The problem today is people are out of the ecosystem yeah. big time, and the managed travel folks are not in control of that. Yeah, and also you're going to have a very different experience across the multiple apps, and nobody wants that. You know, you don't want to be having a certain process well, if you're on a Marriott, it, a different if you're on a Hilton, a different... But everything would be consolidated on a digital itinerary. Well, on the itinerary, yes, but not from a user experience. So but, you, you've but got multiple it, experiences. If, if, you, if you're contracted with Jeff's company, you could have sharing, right? So, I mean, there, is, there are things that could work no. together like this. What do you guys feel about this from the Uber yeah, I think, Airbnb uh, perspective? Yeah, I think the super app trend in Asia is really interesting. I think in order to pull that off, the most likely you know, situation is going to be the mega companies, you know, the Tencent, Sally Babas, et cetera, will be ones to be able to do that. So can a smaller company get big brands to participate and seed control of... The, the user, I think that's going to be a challenge. Um, and uh, I no think any companies, companies like here Uber that could do that, Ronnie? Sorry, what do you no think? Any companies here that could do that? Yeah. Like Tencent? I, right. Yeah. Uh, it, well, no, but I, I think companies like uh, you know, Uber and, and other leading companies don't really want to have the booking occur you know, outside of their uh, ecosystem. There, there's a lot of uniqueness to it, and so turning it over to these third parties to create kind of these super apps, I think, is it's going to be a hard challenge to get the tier one players to participate. That's yeah. good. I, I would I would agree. Um, and also, I look. I think it's it's just another step to um, pushing employees to go a certain route versus understanding that choices is what's there um, today. Um, technology is not getting reined in. Technology is allowing for more flexibility, more convenience, more choice. Uh, allow that to happen and then find ways to connect to, the, to that data, to, uh, to bring that in, to have that visibility, to have that compliance. All of these things are possible. Uh, you don't have to be compliant to drive somebody through an entry point in a portal. Um, I think you also just sacrifice a lot of the things on the experience side there. And I just would say from, from an Airbnb standpoint, we probably would struggle to allow ourselves and our design experience to, to be succumb to, to somebody else. So. 
Bitcoin. You will use the master app. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 look, I think we see this today that great brands build great experiences for their product and consumers want to use them. And, yep. and so, and you'll see that, you do see that, and you'll see more of it, I believe, from the airlines. And again, I, Uber's uh, a real-time uh, great experience today. So uh, I do think there's a tendency that for corporations to want to um, manage the cost of travel and also deal with the duty of care responsibility. And, um, you know, I think there is a lot of innovation. We may see new, uh, po new ways to make that better. I don't think it'll come from the traditional places. We've talked about okay. this. Um, okay. But there's no reason a TMC app has to be horrible. Today, Agreed. for the most part, they're horrible. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. I want to thank Arlene and, and Ronnie and David and Jeff for a great discussion. And thank you very much for your attention. There is a world for those who love five stars, and for those who love all the stars. For those who explore every horizon, especially the horizons within. For the more traditional, for the less conventional, and everyone in between. Yes, there is a world where every journey is an encounter, and every encounter is a journey. A world without boundaries, where the possibilities are as limitless as your dreams.